Will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? You won't have to stand long today. It's short reading. It's one verse. On the way here, I said, yeah, we're preaching on one verse today, and there was silence in the car. I wasn't sure if they were excited. Yeah, disbelief, excitement. They thought, is this going to be shorter? Because I know the, the Auburn basketball game's on right after church today, so maybe Daddy's letting us out. Um, no, there's a lot packed in this one little slight, slight statement that Paul has said. So here now, the reading of God's Word from 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1. I'm pausing to give you time to open your scriptures if you've forgotten we were in Timothy. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, hear the reading of God's word from verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and help us to understand it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, if you were here last week and you're a lady, a female, you may be going, <laughs> you just told me I can't aspire to that, so I'm out of here for today. Let me know how it goes. Um, I think there's a lot in here for the church to understand and to, to grasp. So, I'll remind us that we are studying 1 Timothy and we ought to take it and understand it to be Paul's fatherly counsel to his spiritual son, Timothy. He's saying, uh, Timothy, my son in the gospel and the faith, let me, let me share with you what I have learned. Let me tell you what I know. Let me pass on to you the things that I have uh, taken hold of and what God has shown me. And then I want you to take that and foster and grow the church and build its government and its world and its life around this. So it is a father's counsel nurturing the church. In chapter 3 of Timothy, verse 1, I titled this, Not Every Man. Um, I'm going to mention this again later in the sermon, but it's very fitting that Paul says, um, Hey, I, I don't allow a woman and permit a woman to have authority over a man and teaching and things like that. And then he goes into, we, we go immediately to the qualifications for the elder. Calvin says, hey, Paul's right there for a moment, though, and see what he's saying. He says there are qualifications for the elder. So this is not for every man either. It's not just because you're a man or a female as to whether you can do this office. He said, I have a very specific group of people that are designed and called to this office of the church. Let's, to, to understand this, let's look at Paul's goal. So we're going to look at Paul's goal, called Paul's purpose, uh, his plan for this. And really, we're talking about God's goals, purpose, and plan. And then at the very end, uh, there's going to be this last moment in the sermon where I say, well, who cares? What, what's my plan? What's my purpose? In it? What's, what is my role in all of this? So let's, let's talk through this. Paul's goal is, um, if you think about what he's been telling us, he's been saying, God, Timothy, here's what I want. My desire, my goal, and my purpose is for men everywhere, all kinds of men, different types of men, different nationalities, different races, different levels of education, different levels of wealth. I want all men everywhere doing what? Raising holy hands before God. He wants men to return back to what they were created to be. He wants the new creation to shine forth, the image of God to shine into the world. He wants men leading in godliness. He wants the fruit of the new creation in men, and he wants the fruit of the new creation to shine forth in women. So as men leading godliness, women joyously and joyfully come along beside them and follow them as men lead them in the worship of God with their hands raised high. That's what Paul's desire is. That's what God's desire is. It's for God's name to be honored, God to be glorified, and, for, and he wants that to happen by his people reflecting his glory into the world. A glory of holiness, purity, a, gloriness, a glory of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, a glory of grace, a glory of gentleness, of peace and of patience. So what's Paul's plan then for the church for that. 
Well, this is where we read. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, as this happens a lot of times, the Greeks say it with one word. The English people translate that into three words for us. Epic, uh, eh, episcopes is the office of overseer. That is the Greek word for those three words, office of overseer. We translated it that way because you're going to later on in the next verse see episkopos. Episkopes versus episkopos. Episkopos is the person, the bishop, the person who holds this office. And we'll see the word bishop, episkopos. You'll see uh, elder, presbyteros. You'll see all these different words in the Greek describing this office within the church, this role and purpose within the church. And what we understand this to be is the New Testament or New Covenant administration. Now you go, what do you mean by that? Well, there's an, an old covenant administration. And, and you think about the word administration. You ever been somewhere, like maybe a school, where a new principal comes in? Boy, is it different around here. Some teachers leave. They retire. They just can't put up with the new administration. Um, they bring in, or a new, oh, this is a good one, a new football coach at a college. Everything changes. They start firing people. They bring in new people. And you hope that things get better, that things are different because there's a new leadership. There's a new way that they do things. Or you hope that your rival's movement of getting a new administration just takes them and tanks them to the bottom. There's no, no Alabama-Auburn joke in there at all. But we get the idea of an administration, right? The rules and the way it's governed changes. We see it in the pres president. Why do we care about who's president? Because a new administration brings a new focus and a new, new area that they, they really take, uh, they put their attention to. Because you have all these laws, they can choose to enforce some laws and not really focus on other laws. The administration gets to choose that. So the New Testament administration of the gospel of the grace of God is set up with elders and deacons and, and a certain authority and structure there. But I think it helps us to first understand the Old Testament or the Old Covenant administration. Now, the Old Covenant, what was the administration? How do, and what do we mean? What is he administering even? Well, you've got this covenant of grace. God has said, I will be gracious to you. He, he, he told Adam and Eve, he covered them with the animal skin. Then he told Abraham, I'm going to give you the land. And through your offspring, the world will be blessed. The covenant of grace. I intend and I've committed myself to acting graciously towards creation, towards my people. Now, how he communicates that grace to us is different in the Old Testament versus the New Testament or covenant. In the Old Covenant, he gave the law. And they went, ooh, we're not really doing that, God. He goes, I know. So I'm going to give you a means to overcome that. I'm going to give you the prophets first to point out where you're falling short, to communicate to you your need. Then I'm going to give you the Levitical priesthood who's going to have this ceremonial law that once you go, uh-oh, I'm in trouble before God, the Levitical priesthood goes, come right here. We've got a way for you to get back to God. Well, what is that? Well, I'm going to take this blood of this animal. I'm going to kill it. You bring the animal. We'll sacrifice it. And God will accept this blood on your behalf. And they go, huh, sounds neat. I'll try that. The administration that God put in place led them to understand that there is a sacrifice of blood that has to happen for the, for the sinner who has broken the law to get right and come to God. Then the king, who is over the people, was a representative of God to ensure that the law is not lost, that the Levitical priesthood and the ceremonial law is not lost, and that they are have laws that draw them into holiness and righteousness to structure society, to represent God in leading and setting laws for society. The law, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. And all of those things, it wasn't to keep the people in line and to whip them if they step out of line and do bad things. It was to tell them that God is gracious. You've broken the law. 
But God has provided a way for you to come back to him, even though you are a sinner who has highly offended him. Now, that Old Testament administration, you come up to the New Covenant, New Testament administration, the law is not replaced with grace, but it's covered by grace. The demands and, co and commands of the law and the penalty that the law places on you, the grace of God covers it. How? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Jesus Christ is described as the exact imprint of the nature of God, the radiance of His glory. He communicates to us the perfection of God. He is a prophet. He speaks for God. He speaks on God's behalf. He then also provided a way to God. The blood of animals and goats and bulls, that never really was what saved you. It is my blood, Jesus Christ. Who's the king? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the prophet, the priest, and the king. So the Old Testament, Old Covenant administration was not actually a way to save you. Some people would say that people in the Old Covenant are saved differently than people in the New Covenant. That is wrong. Biblically, that is absolutely not correct. Anyone who gets to heaven comes only through Jesus Christ. The only thing that changed is how God administers and communicates this message to them. In the Old Covenant, before Jesus had come, it was a shadow of reality. Jesus was in heaven waiting to come down. He was the sacrificial lamb. He was the prophet. He was the priest. He was and is the king. And these things were supposed to be shadows of reflection of the heavenly reality. But when Jesus came, you no longer needed these things. So he didn't abolish the law, but he embodies it. And he, he judges against it. And so what happens in the new covenant is we go, how does God communicate to me grace and kindness and that I could be forgiven? He says, look to Jesus. Look to the final sacrifice. Look to the blood of Christ, the cup that is offered. That's why we no longer sacrifice animals. That's why we no longer have prophets. If you are in a church, I was, I've, told, I've said this before, my seminary professor said, if you are ever in a church and someone says, I'm an apostle or I'm, an, I'm a prophet, you got two options. You better absolutely listen to everything that person says because they're proclaiming that they speak for God or you better, which I would recommend, get out because they're a liar and a deceiver and they're claiming to speak for God. That does not exist today. Christ was the last and final revelation. The, the apostles were the, the, the last people that were able to write on behalf of God. The New Testament administration, the scriptures come to us. They exalt Jesus Christ, no longer the shadow of salvation, but the reality of the king coming off of the, out of the throne room, putting himself on the cross, offering himself up for us. And then... And, and what seems absolutely crazy to us, almost as humans who are fallen, he says, I now want to pick some men from among you to lead for me on my behalf. Not to lord over you, not to rule over you in the sense of um, exacting punishment, but to lead you, to teach you, to encourage you, to help you, to, to fix your wounds to guide you, to love you. He has picked the redeemed man to come and to be his under-shepherd. We don't come with the authority of Jesus Christ. We, become on behalf, we come on behalf of Jesus Christ to the people to proclaim forgiveness of sins, not to forgive them ourselves, to proclaim the righteousness of Christ, not to bestow the righteousness of Christ upon you, the shepherds, the elders, the episcopates, that office is responsible. And the, God, Paul's plan was for them to represent you, the, the Christ, to the church. And there was the word. I forgot to pull that slide up. That's the Greek episcopates. I just wanted to look really smart. Um, I really have no idea why I put that up there, actually. Maybe it was. I was um, trying to look really arrogant last night when I was finalizing the slides. They tell you not to do that. They say, don't go up there and talk about a bunch of Greeks. You're trying to sound smart. Um, but I didn't heed that today, obviously. 
what is Paul's purpose in this? So we've got his plan. Um, what is his purpose? Why is he doing this? Well, that word episkopes, um, if we understand it, 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 the word actually means visitation. So it's, it's like this act of visiting someone and coming to them for inspection, for an investigation, to see how things are going. Uh, if you're familiar with the idea of the Septuagint, that is, you know, the, the Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew. And then before the New Testament uh, came into play and they'd written it, they took the Old Testament and they translated it into Greek for the Greek-speaking world. That's the Septuagint. It's valuable to us because we're not trying to translate the New Testament, which was written in Greek. We understand some things in the Old Testament, so now we can go, we believe this word means this. How did they use the Greek language here to translate the, the Old Testament? And so we get to understand a little bit about a little bit more about the Greek words that are used in the Old Testament because we have a translation of the Old Testament into that language. We, we can see how they use the words in translating. And one of the things, a couple of the places that we see episcopes is in Jeremiah 11.23. It is the visitation of God. And this word right here, punishment, is actually the word episcopes. And what, we're, what we understand, what the uh, translators were trying to say is that there was a visitation of God or there will be a visitation of God that will bring disaster upon these men who have not repented. They will come as punishment. So it is a visitation with the purpose of inspecting, investigating, finding things wrong, and bringing punishment. Now, you go, up to, go back to Genesis and you see the exact opposite connotation of that visitation. It's not always about punishment. When Joseph was talking to his, and had said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will episcopus you. He will visit you. And he's going to bring you up out of this land of Egypt that he swore to your, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. So this visitation of God is now not for, for punishment, but for grace. And so we see this word used to, in speaking of the visitation of God to bring both judgment and to bring grace, to inspect and go, these people deserve and, and require punishment for their, what they've done. These people, he inspected and found the same problems. He didn't go, oh, these people are better than these people, so I'm going to be gracious to them. No, he inspected it, looked at the situation, said, they're sinners, but they're my covenant people. I have made a promise to them, so I am going to redeem them. So now we come back up to the idea of bishops is what that word in the, in the New Testament, that's what Timothy would be using here. Or elders is another way, presbyteros is another trans, is, is not another translation, but it's the, a different word used to talk to the same office and, per, and person in the church. These are God's representatives as he comes and visits you, as he comes to you. Now, um, why does the office of elder exist? Why are they visiting? What are they coming? What are they bringing? And you go, great. I had to clean my house up because they're going to come visit me. I don't want that. It's this idea of them being invested in your lives, coming to you to deliver the gospel. A promise of punishment if you remain in your sins and a promise of grace for those who have come out of their sins and received Christ. So for the church, the elders... The, presbyte, the, presbyte, uh, the, the, the episcopes are coming and responsible for reaffirming to you and reminding you that you are a gracious recipient of God's favor and that you ought to live that way. You ought to drive towards that. And here's the thing. They are messengers of God's judgment and of his grace in your life. And this reprimand that they bring, any reprimand they bring to you ought not to be taken lightly. Now, you want something countercultural today, go tell people that I'm supposed to submit to the leadership of the church. That's what you all agreed to if you're members here. I don't know if you remember that one little question. You made a public profession that I, do you commit yourself to listen and follow and lead and follow the leadership of the elders? And everybody goes, yes, I do. Until that day they get on to me and they get mad at me and they, the, whatever words you want to put in there, and then I'm just going to another church because it's a whole lot easier. That's how society does it. But that's not Paul's purpose and plan behind it. 
the, these elders, and these rulers, and these leaders in the church, this office was designed to pull us from the brink of disaster away from sin, to encourage us towards holiness, to warn us of the dangers of following the ways of the world, and to encourage us and excite that spark of hope within us that we are saved by the grace of God and God's power is working in us. God's spirit lives within us. The, the elders are driving towards that and helping us understand that, helping us to embrace it, to believe it, to remember it when everything in all of life is telling us that you are a worthless piece of junk. And you go, I don't know if anybody tells you that. You don't think that? Go look at every commercial. Every commercial tells you that you're going to die if you don't take this pill. You're not going to look nice if you don't wear these clothes. You don't eat these foods. You don't eat it in this way. You don't exercise on this machine. You're worthless. You're useless and you're invaluable. You're, I mean, you're a terrible person, but I've got a solution for you, the world says. Wherever you feel down and out, I can fix it by this thing and it will make you feel better. And the elders, their job is to remind you of Scripture. Oh, you need Jesus. You need a relationship with your God, your Father. You are beautiful as God made you. He didn't look down and go, man, I made them all look different. I have really messed up. I need to make them all look the exact same. Let me go put all these things in place to make them their bodies, their physical aspects. I want them all to look the same. God, no, he created a diverse lot of us all because he thinks we're beautiful and we're glorious because we reflect his image of creativity. And he says, I want my leaders in the church to foster that idea that you are holy and good in Christ and in Christ alone, as we just sang. Now, these representatives of God, Paul says this of it. There's a trustworthy word from God, a trustworthy saying. You see, this is why he says this, because he had just said women can't be in this role. Women... Um, Talked about it last week. There's, a, there's reasons behind all that, but we really want you to fulfill your God-given, God-designed role of being a helper to come alongside uh, of, of the men and do what you're to do there. So he excludes women, but he also excludes men. It's a good and trustworthy saying that just because this group of people can't, it doesn't open the floodgates to let every man who ever wants to lead the church to come in. Because what's happening in Ephesus? False teachers are coming in. What's happening, happening in Corinth on Sunday evenings when we're, when we're going through that, the Corinthians, false teachers are coming in. They're going, Paul's an idiot. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. I've got the true truth. He says, why are all these men stepping up and leading? He said, they are not godly people. This is not for every man. He says, this is for the one, first of all, who aspires to this role. He says, church, quit trying to place the burden of the office of a ruling elder or teaching elder upon every person who you like in the church. We go, man, I need some more people to lead in this church. Hey, you, why don't you come up and you, you be a leader? Why don't you be a leader? He says, no. Do they have an internal calling? Don't just go begging people for this. God will drive people to it. Do they have that internal desire and then what we'll learn, learn over the next couple of weeks are these people who are placed or called into this leadership that stand up and say, I want to take upon this, this, this work upon myself. Well, do they match these external marks? Do they have the external calling? Do you, the church, approve by looking at what Paul has written to Timothy? Do you agree that these people embody the spirit of being in this role? In the PCA, this denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, we have three offices. We first of all have the deacon, which we're not mentioning here. That's the next few verses down after we talk about the uh, elders. The deacons are, if you remember Acts chapter 7, 6? No, I can't remember which one now. Um, the the, the uh, uh, apostles said, hey, we've got too much work to do. We're not able to distribute the funds that were received out to the widows and the people in, in mercy needs. He says, let's pick seven men among us, among this group, and, and send them out and, and make them the deacons, the servants, the diaconates. So that is an office that we have. And then we have two offices for elders. We have the ruling elder and the teaching elder. My office is teaching, and then the other elders in this church are ruling elders. Their responsibility is within the local body. My responsibility is I'm actually a member of Presbytery, sent here by the Presbytery, called by you to lead this area of the church. 
uh, because we believe we are a bigger church than just this. We are a presbytery. We are a denomination. We are a universal church in Christ. So those three offices, the one we're talking about today is the elder ruling and teaching elder. And he says, don't just put anybody in those positions. It's a noble task. Those words there literally mean a good work. It is very good for someone to do it. To have oversight of God's people is a good job to undertake, but it is very difficult. So it's not for everyone. See, elders often live in this underbelly of the church. It's an area of the church that's not often seen. One of the things you realize is when you get into leadership of the church, you go, wow, we really do need Jesus because sin is everywhere. And then you start going, wow, maybe I thought too highly of myself. I am a sinner as well. I just was overlooking things. And you start to realize the elders live in the most sensitive parts of the church most often. They are the ones that, that where the church's weaknesses are exposed and their responsibilities in there are to ward off those who would attack the weakness of the church and seek to steal those who are in their weakness ready to leave. They're there to treat the wounds of those who have been wounded. They are to identify and warn of the dangers coming at the church. There's a role there that most of the church doesn't even realize exists and is happening. And this is by Paul's design, God's design. He says, put men in these positions that have these external marks that we're going to go through next week that are showing off their ability and their capability to lead and to really withstand. And, and, and how is it? Is it because they're better men? Because they've worked out their whole lives or they're stronger? No. Is it because, well, these men have read their Bibles more, so they're clearly better equipped for this? No. It's because the Spirit of God working in them has marked them for this purpose, for this role. And he's going to give us evidence of that. Now, why do we care? If, if it's something I don't really see a whole lot of, and I don't really, what's my role in this? Meaning, y'all, why, why, why would I care about this? Because y'all just go do your thing, and we'll be happy, be the church, and we'll keep functioning and living. And Well, here's the beauty of it. There are different types of government. There are three primary types of government in the church universal that have, that have risen up over the years. For the first that most of us in America are familiar with is congregational. Um, this would be like our Baptist brothers and sisters who say um, anything that they do has to come to a vote of the full congregation. They believe in their, in their governmental system that God leads through the vote and the leadership of the people. They would vote to elect leaders who are, who are answerable to the people. They would vote to do anything and everything within the church. And, and everything is local within that body. Another side of that is the Episcopalian-type government, which would be found in the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church, the Roman Catholic Church. It is a hierarchical structure that, um, like for the Roman Catholics, they believe that Peter was given the authority of the apostles, uh, was given the authority of Jesus Christ, and upon, my, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. They would say that that was Peter, who was then the uh, uh, first pope, that then there was always a single male leader at the top that speaks for God. It is not the will of the people that speaks for God. It is a, an individual person that is very near and close to God that has the capability to speak on behalf of God. And then there's a hierarchy and structure of people below him that break out into bishops and different things that use biblical words to get down to the local body to say, you have bishops, you have priests, you have these things and they lead you and they are to draw people and drive them to Christ. The third one is where we land, the Presbyterian system. It um, says that there is no single man because of, of sin. Like the congregational church would say, why would you ever have men or groups of men be leaders because of sin they could corrupt? Um, the Presbyterian kind of comes into the best of both worlds. Um, it's not like we pick and choose which one. One of them is biblical. We've got to decide which one we think is biblical. And for the Presbyterian uh, methodology, uh, the, the federal government of our nation is really based off of these principles of separation of responsibilities, separations of duties, separations of, of leadership, the will of the people. So it's not that it's the will of the people, but God does lead through his people. You would, we elect elders. We call teaching elders. We, we call ruling elders to, to serve. And then they are examined by the body of elders that exist. So it's a, it's a hierarchy and structure, but there's no single person above and on top of it other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head. 
and lead and person that is above all of the church. And what you see within these structures is, um, if you go over to like uh, Acts 15, you'll see the Presbyterian model kind of take shape. There's a dispute locally. The leaders of that church say, hey, let's go talk to the elder, the apostles in Jerusalem. So they, they appeal to a larger body, but not to the vote of the entire church. But there's a belief that what Paul is setting up here is there are certain people who are called by God to lead and certain people that are not. And it's not male and female. It is some are marked by God and some are not. Now, Paul says we would restrict females from this role, but we also restrict a whole lot of men, right? We're, we're keeping a whole lot of men out of this role. So what is my job? My job is to, your job, is to first, that external calling. You would vote and elect and call uh, people to be these roles. Identify those who are marked for this role. The second responsibility you have is to heed them. Satan encourages you when, that, when an elder comes to you or a session or a group and says, I observe this in your life and I believe there's room for repentance. Satan says, man, get out of there. You don't need people telling you what to do. You don't need that guy that stands up there and preaches every week making you feel bad about yourself, which I hope I don't. You're supposed to see the gospel in it and grace and hope. But Satan starts to drive you away from listening to the people that God's placed in authority in your life, and he draws you away from it. But God demands obedience to them. Another thing is, I would say, forego this office. And you go, wait a minute, don't we need more elders? Yes, your elders have been serving here five, eight, ten years. A lot of most sessions get to rotate on and off. These guys haven't. They're working hard for you. They are, they are tirelessly working to, to, to build the kingdom here, to, to encourage you and strive for God's glory here. But here's the thing. When I first showed interest in going into the ministry, I had a pastor look at me and says, if you can do anything else in life and be happy, go do that. That wasn't him going, oh, Lord, let me out of this. I hate this job. He goes, I'm called to this. I love it. But if there's any inkling that this is not a calling from God upon your life, Go do that because this will eat you alive if God is not working in you. And then Calvin commenting on this said um, what we would say of, of every government that we've ever seen. He says, why do so many who have neither the ability nor wisdom, why do they often aspire so confidently to hold the reins of government? And we would go, amen, looking at our federal government today. Why are the people that are leading the ones that we go, they're the least capable of leading, it seems like. It's because, Calvin says, they rush forward with their eyes shut. So the men in this room, they go, I think I'd like to do this. Hallelujah. But be very careful. Trade lightly. And what we mean by that is pray, 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 pray. But if you start to think, I, I think I would like to be a leader in the church, please do. The church needs good, godly, young, godly men to step up and be the leaders for the next generation. The next to the last thing you should do is honor this role. Value it very highly. Speak highly of those who hold this office. Do not let negative words about the people in this office come out of your mouth, whether in society and your family. Hold your tongues. And if you've got an issue with something they've done, said, or acted, go to that person or go to one of the other elders. Keep it within the body. Keep it within the group to give them an opportunity to repent. Just as you would with any brother and sister in Christ. If someone sinned against you, go to them. And if they hear you and they repent, you've earned and gained your brother or sister back. I would say this is especially true of the elders. Because what better way to tear down a, an entity and an organization than to tear down the leadership of it and to expose its sin? Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you right now, you want to expose the elder's sin, you can sure do it. we got a lot of it. The reality is we all do. We weren't called to this role because we're good, holy, perfect men that, that don't ever sin and we're saying, look and be like us. We are fallen men called by the grace of God to lead. And if you see fault in us, come to us deal with us, and give us the opportunity to repent. Speak highly of us. Expect much of us. Encourage us. Encourage us. Pray for us. Lean on us. And then understand this, that Christ is the head of the church. He has chosen to lead through fallen men who have been redeemed, but they're still got that old man pulling back. 
You can get angry at times. We can say stupid things. We can think we're doing the greatest aspects of leadership and really hurting people. We, that's a possibility. We fully admit that. Be gracious with us. Be gracious to your leaders, the men who exemplify the life of the new creation to us, the men who seek to live holiness, seek to be an example to the body, but also repent regularly of their sins because they're fallen. And in honoring the leaders Christ has placed over us, we honor Christ as the Lord of our lives. What Paul is trying to say is, Timothy, I'm telling you to go into the church at Ephesus, look around, and see who it is that's aspiring to this office. And then vet them. See if they fit. See if they're called by God, marked by God. And if they are, put them in this highly honorable office. And you know what? People go, I want that office because it's, it's, it's honored and it, it looks good. It looks good on my resume or whatever words you would use. You know what it is? It's an office of servitude where you die to yourself and go live and work in the dregs of the church and, and serve people and serve people and serve people even when it hurts the most. That's not what people think they're signing up for. But that's what Paul is trying to tell Timothy. Make sure people are equipped and called by God for this role. And then when they are, help them, encourage them, and let them lead in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who is our Savior, and who is the reason we are all gathered here today. Let's pray. Father, your word is good and true. And I pray that each and every one of us would, um, would, would lean upon Paul's teaching here to take serious and, and highly honor the role of elder within the church. And where we have not in the past, help us to repent. And, and where we have opportunities in the future, Father, give us the strength and, and, and insight into our lives to honor this role. Father, if there are young men or old men today in, this, in the hearing of my voice that are aspiring to this role, to this office. I pray that you would help them, encourage them, strengthen them in that. Give them that confidence to know, is this where you have me, Lord? Do not let them shrink back for fear, but let them move forward with confidence if it is truly your calling in their lives. We pray that they would exemplify the, the traits of an elder that we will see and talk about next week. Um, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.